sure what the federal entire deal is, how much it dilutes. Right. Well, it's different for each state. It's going to take a long time to turn around and get everybody to vote. So let's begin with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, enlighten our minds and our hearts. Help us to be aware of your presence this evening and in every aspect and in every moment of our lives. Bless our time this evening. May this time here be fruitful, educational, but more importantly, give us a greater love for your sacraments, especially the sacraments of matrimony and holy orders. I ask you to bless all of the efforts of Sacred Heart Parish. Keep us all united to the consolation of the Sacred Heart of your Son. We ask Our Lady to intercede for us as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, well, you survived the what was supposed to be a four-week course oops, on the sacraments, which became a five-week course. You survived. You made it to the final one, save in the best for last, I guess, or they're all the best, so I can't really say that. But holy orders and matrimony is what we'll get to. These are called the, the sacraments, either the sacraments of mission or the sacraments at the service of communion. So the first three is initiation, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, sacraments of healing, um, penance, or reconciliation, anointing of the sick, and then finally the sacraments of mission, or at the service of communion, because holy orders and matrimony are focused on other people. So the married couple, they're focused on one another, and hopefully the children that, please God, come from their union, and whatever local community that, that they're a part of. And however, practical way they serve the church or they serve the world and sanctify the world and offer it back to God through their everyday life, whatever that may be, however simple or grandiose it may be. And as we'll come to learn, the ordained priesthood is, the ministerial priesthood, as it's called, is at the service of the common priesthood. So by virtue of each of our baptisms, so far as we are baptized, we share in the priestly, and prophetic, and kingly office of Christ. So we're all lowercase p, lowercase p priests by sanctifying the world through our actions, through our prayer, through offering sacrifice, you know, the whole offer it up thing we were talking about, and um, to sanctify the world. And so the ministerial priesthood is at the service of the common priesthood to help sanctify and teach and govern and to teach the laity, the lay faithful, how to make their life a sacrifice and an offering to God in, in every way. And so priests exist. You don't just become a priest for yourself. You become a priest to serve the church and to serve the common priesthood. And of course, it's a call. It's a vocation, just as marriage is. And um, so just a brief little intro on that. But real quick, just to recap on the sacraments of healing, in case you missed it or our minds just forget what we talked about. We talked about a lot, of course, but I think the most essential parts can be broken down into these three. Number one is the, I have to use my whiteboard because it's down here. It's trying to get second. Um, the vertical and horizontal dimension of sin. So sin is always first and foremost an offense against God. So that's, that's what sin is. We were created to be in union with him. And sin damages that union. It damages that relationship. And so it's an offense against God. But as we, in our baptism class, we had a quote from Pope Benedict from Space Salvi. It says, no one sins alone and no one dies alone. So all of our sins affect the body of Christ. So we are all members of the church, all members of the body of Christ. So sin also has this vertical, horizontal dimension, which is how our sin impacts other people. So every single sin is an offense against God, but it damages, it wounds the integrity, if you will, 
kind of the, the body of Christ. It affects the body. A natural example, you stub your toe, you feel it throughout your body. I have a head cold. I'm, my whole body is aware of it, and I'm not as up to 100% because of this one little thing. And so every sin, all the way from skipping Mass on Sunday, that affects other people because I'm not there contributing to the worship of God and sanctifying the world and being a member of this community, all the way from imp impure thoughts, objectifying people in our imagination, from gossip and backbiting, I damage the reputation of a person. So all of our sins impact other people, which is all the more fitting that Jesus was crucified on a cross because it's that image itself, this black leather thing, um, shows the vertical and horizontal dimension of, of sin and how it affects the world. But luckily, which leads us to our second point, is that we should never <coughs> talk about sin apart from the context of God's mercy and justice. We should never talk about sin without the context of mercy. And mercy comes from justice. They're not mutually exclusive. Because I think there's been a bad um, history of both within the Catholic faith and outside in whatever non-Catholic Christian denominations is a sort of a sin shaming, if you will, in the sense of don't do this or you'll go to hell or don't do this, blah, 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 like of, this, of just a mere list of do's and don'ts. You need to understand sin within the context of no, I shouldn't sin because I love the Lord and because the Lord died for me and he didn't want me to be separated from him for all eternity so he sacrificed himself so I could have life and um, St. Therese of Lisieux talks about like I expect much I expect as much from God's mercy as I do from his justice because justice is giving to each person their due so I borrow a hundred bucks from Rich I gotta give it back I gotta, I gotta return it um, someone breaks a law, they rob a convenience store, they should be reprimanded. They should go to jail or whatever. Like, that's what law is all about. There would be no mercy if there was no just retribution for wrongs committed. And so mercy is a, is a compassion and a forgiving of... So God is just and merciful. So he allows us to... He, he's given us free will to make our own decisions and whatnot, but... And so, in the end, his justice will prevail, but the ultimate act of divine mercy is sending his son to die for us on the cross. So mercy and justice are not mutually exclusive, but we should call each other out on our sins, and we would hope that others would do so for us, not just to shame us, because sin makes us less human, and um, we want to purge ourselves from sin as this lifelong process in order to live the virtuous life and the fulfilled life. So we should... Whenever we're talking about sin and mercy, sin should be within the context of God's mercy. Like he came to save us from our sins, to save, save us from ourselves. And especially with anointing of the sick, there's sort of a, a primacy of spiritual healing. So we pray for and hope sometimes that within an actual anointing of the sick, that whatever ailment or whatever is wrong with a person, that there could be a miraculous healing. It's happened before. Perhaps we know situations where that has happened. Um, but the primary effect is that suffering and illness makes us can, is jarring, and it can make us doubt God. It can make us question him or lash out in anger. And so the sacrament of anointing of the sick is to dispel fear and to, to bestow courage and hope. And so we hope for a greater spiritual healing for conversion and forgiveness of sins through anointing of the sick. So that's just kind of – I also have leftover handouts. I can give them to you from this conference from last week if you want them to take home. So I have leftovers. I mean, and if anyone wants copies of any of the classes, just let me know. Okay, so on to the sacraments of the service of communion, of holy orders and matrimony. But before I get into this, I need to remember and realize that love is the fundamental and innate vocation of every human being. That our lives are supposed to be grounded and founded upon love. That's the typo. It should say quotes one and two. My bad. Forgive me. Um, your handout is right. The PowerPoint is wrong. So quote number one on your quote sheet. God who created man out of love also, call, also calls him to love. 
the fundamental and innate vocation of every human being. Man is created in the image and likeness of God, who is himself love. So we are created in the image and likeness of God, God who is this communion of persons, who is this unending source from beginning without, with no end of love. And we are created and brought up into that, especially through, through our baptism. So our life is supposed to be founded upon and lived in love, which quote number two, which is one of my favorite things of all time, from John Paul II, Redemptor Hominis, so the Redeemer of Man. This was the encyclical that he wrote when he became first became Pope. He says, man cannot live without love. He remains a being that is incomprehensible for himself. His life is senseless if love is not revealed to him, if he does not encounter love, if he does not experience it and make it his own, if he does not participate intimately in it. Man cannot live without love, full stop. That's that is life. Our life is supposed to be lived in love. We have to experience the fullness of love. And the fullness of love leads to the fullness of life. And that's what our life is meant to be. And that's what these sacraments, that's what holy orders of matrimony is all about. It's about giving yourself to something out of love. Giving your, your life in return to God out of gratitude for all that he's done for us, for the gift of our existence. And we're meant to serve other people out of love. And so, yeah, just quote number two, like, I'm not promoting tattoos, but if you were to get one, this would be a good one to get. Just say, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to do that anytime soon, so. No. Uh, Rich probably already has that tattooed. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm just picking on him. And um, just a quick mention of quote number three is that, and I said this already, I guess, but holy orders and matrimony are directed towards the salvation of others. And if they contribute to our personal salvation, it is through service to others that they do so. And so marriage and holy orders give a mission in the church. So by being married, it's like my mission right now is to love my spouse and raise, raise my family and serve the church in whatever way I'm supposed to. And by holy orders, I'm called to serve the church you know, as a priest. And so let's, let's dig into to matrimony here. Directed towards the salvation of others. So, a husband is supposed to get his wife to heaven, and vice versa. A wife is supposed to get her husband to heaven. And both husband and wife are supposed to raise their, try to get their kids to heaven by teaching them the faith. The family is called the domestic church. It's a little church because that's where the child first learns about God, about who he, he, whom he or she is, and what the purpose of their life is. And so, the importance of the family. So, kind of a theological foundation, head in the clouds, kind of some overarching thing here. So, marriage is special because throughout salvation history, it's all one big marriage feast, if you will. It starts with a couple, Adam and Eve. And then from that emerges this people. And they, you know, we have the call of Abraham and the establishment of a nation of Israel. And then, um, the, ex the exodus, freedom from Egypt, and receiving the, the, the Torah, the law, on Mount Sinai, they become a people, and God speaks constantly through the prophets of the people of Israel as like his bride, a bridegroom loving his bride, especially on your handout, it says, if you read anything in the prophet Hosea, especially, which we have these past couple weeks, a little off and on in um, daily mass, um, it's all of this wedding imagery of, you are my people, and this call to faithfulness, to faithful love. And then, obviously, the New Testament, Christ is the bridegroom, and his bride is the church. Ephesians 5, Christ sacrifices himself out of love for his bride, the church. Jesus' first miracle, I didn't put that up there, takes place at a wedding, the wedding feast of Cana. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, I believe. Yeah. And so, Christ's um, unique um, love for that sacrament by his presence there and by by starting his public ministry if you will with his first miracle at a wedding and if you read in the old testament the song of songs or it's called the canticle of canticles or the song of solomon it's all about this um, radical and very serious love of the bride 
and the groom, and it's analogous of, again, of Christ's love for the church, but it's also of God's love, intentional love for each individual soul. Of There's this, throughout the Song of Songs, it's this, I can't find my love, my can't find him, he's out, I look for him, I search. And so it kind of talks about our whole life, is like sometimes we live our lives and we're, we're right, we seem to get everything and like, yeah, we're there, like God seems close and then there's times where he seems far away. And so the Song of Songs captures all of that and it's all about God's total and relentless love for each soul, and especially the church. And then the book of Revelation, to cap it all off, speaks of John sees images and foreshadow of the wedding feast of the Lamb, the eternal liturgy in heaven, the wedding feast of the Lamb, is what John sees, and that's what kind of revelation is all about. And so, and God is the author of marriage. And although marriage has sort of been variously instituted, as Thomas Aquinas would say, like throughout different human cultures, it looks differently. This idea of man and woman being created for each other and entering into this union is ordained by him. And so he is truly the author of all marriage. Which leads me to my next point of marriage under the regime of sin. In the catechism, this is from the catechism that comes out there. A priest that I respect and admire a lot um, gave me some advice last year while I was in the seminary studying homiletics of preaching and so how to give homilies. And um, this priest, knowing I was studying that, said, yeah, you know, you want to you wanna refrain from being divisive in your preaching in the sense of, like, preaching against the culture. You don't just want to make the culture the bad guy or whatever. And it's like, on one hand, I get that. Like, it's easy to point fingers or whatnot. But I think in my time here, I have very much, as an old man, have ranted against, preached against the culture, and I'm not ashamed because this, the godlessness of this culture that we live in is anti-family and it is anti-life. So I am not going to stand in the house of God and keep my mouth shut about a culture that hates marriage, about a culture that hates life, about a culture that promotes casual sex um, not commitment um, that promotes uh, div divisiveness. Like, I'm not going to endure that. None of us should. None of us should. We should defend marriage at every cost, at every cost. And it's difficult because marriage is messy. Relationships are messy. And, um, and the church gets that. And I, I don't think people get that the church gets it. And perhaps some people have had bad experiences of the church, and um, especially through perhaps a divorce or something. And, um, and it truly makes me sad that, because um, the catechism literally calls you know, divorce a plague, and because that's kind of what it is. And it's a shame that people, church-going people, can, um, might want to ostracize these people or whatnot. And um, I was talking to a lady at a previous parish assignment, and she you know, a divorcee herself, and but yet still faithful to the church and, you know, going to Mass and all that, and it's just like, I hope that we can arrive at a better ministry for people like us who have experienced divorce, and like, knowing that like, divorced, yeah, please come and receive communion, like, um, the, obviously divorce and remarriage is a different situation, but those who have gone through the horror of, of that issue, like, no, like, you still belong in the church, like, the church you know, we're a field hospital, and we want to want you to search in the right place. And um, you're not. No one will find what they're looking for in this co in this culture that is hostile to married love. And it is only within the heart of the church and within the heart of Christ that we understand the true meaning of marriage of what it's supposed to be, and to try to do the best that we can to um, fight against this culture of death and this culture of that wants to deny the goodness of marriage. Because the church understands that what Christ has revealed about marriage is pretty, it's a high bar and a lot of good stuff. But we're, we're down here a little bit. And the path is gradual and the situation is messy. And the church realizes that. 
And you know what? We just got to roll up our sleeves and say, that's okay. That's the situation. But let's, let's journey with Let's journey with these people, and let's preach the gospel, let's preach the truth, and let's preach the goodness of man and woman and the goodness of married love, which I think perhaps a pitfall of a reason for this hostile culture is because perhaps us men of the cloth haven't done as good of a job preaching the goodness of marriage and preaching the goodness of male and female. And so I think that's a part of the new evangelization is um, showing Masculinity and femininity are good things. And married love and, de and devotion, lifelong commitment is good. And quotes number six and seven kind of get at this. This is the catechism under the regime of sin. Number six, man experiences evil all around him, especially within himself, this internal discord. This experience makes it felt, especially in the relationship between men and women, this union has always been threatened by discord, the spirit of domination, infidelity, jealousy, and conflicts that can escalate into hatred and separation. This disorder can manifest itself more acutely. Read more blah, blah, blah. Number seven, uh, the disorder we notice so painfully does not stem from the nature of man and woman, nor from the nature of their relationship, but from sin. So it's important to remember that Sometimes marriage is a mess, yes. It's not because man is a completely depraved being or woman is a completely depraved being. It's because, hey, sin is a thing. We have an inclination to sin. We are fallen people. We are deprived, uh, but not depraved. We are not completely depraved. Like We are in need of grace. But luckily, God in his goodness established marriage as a remedy for um, these difficulties. Quote number eight. To heal the wounds of sin, man and woman need the help of the grace that God in his infinite mercy never refuses them. God never refuses his grace. Without his help, man and woman cannot achieve the union of their lives for which God created them in the beginning. In his mercy, God has not forsaken sinful man. After the fall, Marriage helps to overcome self-absorption, egoism, the pursuit of one's own pleasure, and to open oneself to the other, to mutual aid and self-giving. There was a priest of happy memory, Monsignor Pins, who would apparently, every wedding homily, he would say like, to the couple, like, what you're doing is impossible. Uh, anyone who's ever been married, I think, knows that it's very hard. <laughs> it's, it's impossible, next to impossible to do that. But, but it's not impossible with the help of God's grace. And that's why marriage is a sacrament, a sign that gives grace, that does what it signifies. God knowing our, our weak nature, he gives us his grace to live it out faithfully. On, I try whenever I can, if I ever get a break, which I did last week, I go to Wisconsin and I spend time with my sister and my brother-in-law and my little nephew, Louis. And I think my visits with them, living with this married couple, um, my sister and her and her husband, that has done more for me to teach me and inform me about marriage than I think reading books about marriage can ever do. Like, I would go to Mass with them on Sunday, and I got to see firsthand what an ordeal it is to get a two-year-old <laughs> <laughs> calmed down, dressed, which is an ordeal, which... What do you want to bring with you? And then, like, I want to, uh, and then to get him into the car seat, to dress themselves, to make the husband and wife to dress themselves, get themselves ready. And um, so I'm just like, I, I'm not saying this to, to toot my own whistle, but like, I never look with, um, uh, how, do, how do you say it? Like, uh, yeah, whenever I see a family coming in late, because I'm like, I'm like, no, I get it, I've seen it, I was there, and. Um, my parents had to do that to me when I was a little, when I was a little brat or whatever. So, um, that's right. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, that's just one kid, and so like multiple, and then teenagers. Don't even get me started. Like, <laughs> but teenagers are great. They're God's creatures, um, and I'm just like wow, and just and seeing like, especially right when my nephew was born, I went up there like the week after, and 
oh my god, like my sister is a very beautiful person, but I walk in, <laughs> look at she hadn't showered in a while, <laughs> and like hair just, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, yeah, sorry, Emily, <laughs> and you know, the bags under her eyes, and like, she's like, hey, Jack, <laughs> like, like, what can I do to help you, and like, and just like, I couldn't tell you how many times, in those two days that I stayed there, that weekend when my nephew was born, how many times they changed little Lewis's diaper. Don't I don't, yeah, I just, <laughs> it never ends, it's, it's funny, because I went up there before they had the baby, and like, I was like, oh, this is fun, like, my sister and my brother-in-law, but like, once that baby was born, it's like, everything is around this child, and I think you all know, and that's good, that's a good thing, it is beautiful, it's messy, but, <laughs> God, yeah, they are messy, but God, and like, and the house gets that way, and you get that yeah, way. I get my two day fix, and I'm like driving back. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like, that's all I can take. I know, yeah. Okay, Neely. Yeah, yeah. But that's why marriage is a sacrament to give grace, to joyfully live it out, to not live it out begrudgingly, to not live it out like, oh, I gotta change this back. Like, and oh my God, and like waking up in the middle of the night, like, that's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, multiple times. My visits there have taught me so much, and I'm just like, wow. And I love it here in a, where I did my internship. It's like sometimes I have to strain to hear father's homilies because I hear crying babies, and I love that because I'm like, I mean, the parents probably don't love that, but um, who have the screaming child. But I'm just like, I think that's a sign of a healthy parish, that there's young people and old people and middle-aged people. It's like you hear hearing babies crying. Like that's a beautiful and a good thing. And um, so I think every seminarian should have a sister or something or someone that's doing a, do a thing like live with a married couple for a weekend and have fun. <laughs> Just like, and yeah, then like, like oh, God, right, yeah. go for a month. A month, Daniel. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's Marie's oh, method yeah, of doing it. Yeah, that's go right, for, a for month sure. Because for sure. you've got to do everything do within it. that month. We'll start a program, Marie. Of <laughs> yeah. Seminarians encounter married life. Yes, you know. I know how to teach in school where yeah. the kids have to carry around the bag. That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'll send those seminarians running back to the seminary for sure. I'm like, <laughs> but, uh, I'm glad I'm here. That's right. <laughs> Marriage is good. Yeah. Male and female are good things. Surprise. Um, it's not so obvious these days, I think. Things that seem so obvious aren't so obvious anymore, especially now with gender dysphoria and gender fluidity and the, the number of genders that are there that, you know. And um, as much as I want to, you know, be angry, which, you know, it's frustrating. I can be, in my fallen humanity, I can be frustrated by it. But also, on the same hand, I can, I can admit that I have no idea what type of emotional spiritual and psychological suffering these people are experiencing. And uh, I cannot wrap my mind around that. And so these people need to, hear, need to hear the gospel too, that they are a human person and that they are loved by God. And we need to preach um, the goodness and the dignity of male, male and female. And the catechism says that men and women were made for each other. This is obvious through natural law, just through the way our bodies were made, the, the physical complementarity, and it's through divine revelation. If I, really, the first commandment is be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth and fill it. That is the first thing he commands them to do. So God created sex to be a good thing within the context of marriage to populate the earth and to be for the good of the spouses. I can't believe this was a crazy past week, so your outline is a little malnourished, but we say the, the two ends of marriage. Procreation and education of children. And the good of the spouses, that it is good
for those whom God has given the vocation of marriage, like, it is good for them to be married. He's like, he's not going to call Frank to be married because he wants him to be miserable the rest of his life because he knows that this is for his good and it's for the good of his spouse. And so these two, there is no priority. It's been cool. It's cool. I'm not, I didn't get into this in the outline, but, like, the church kind of wrestles is like, is, is children first or, and good of spouse is second or is this first? Like, no, they're inseparable and they go together. That it is good for the man and woman to be married to each other and the fruit of that union, the procreation, to have children, but to raise them and educate them. That's the ends and purpose of marriage. And so male and female is huge. And I know, of, especially in our day and age, with the question of, you know, of, of gay marriage and all this stuff and of, of, of homosexuality, and I would say we could go down a rabbit hole in this, but I'm just going to say this of like, those who have same-sex attraction belong in the church. That that's another suffering that I won't be able to understand. But um, what the culture wants to say in regard to that they want to put the level of identity here. Which is such a shallow is such a shallow person attraction and action. They want, if, so, if a man is attracted to other men, they say, oh, you, you're gay, that's your identity. And it's like, no. You're a human being. You are a person. We all have attractions. We all have stuff in our life that some healthy and some not. Like, I think that's part of alcoholics, not the 12th step of like, it's like I am not refusing the identity. I'm not an alcoholic. I struggle with alcohol. I'm a person. Alcohol is my struggle. Or whether it be drugs or other sexual addictions, and it's just like um, these people who have same sex. That's why that we want to we don't want to label people as gay or as lesbian, but just to say like, no, you're a human person. This attraction that you have, like, it's just an attraction, and like we don't want to act on that. And just like, am I like I have attractions, but I shouldn't be acting on them. But like we can, through the virtue of chastity and self discipline. We can achieve Christian freedom. And um, so I wish that this was yelled loud and clear throughout the streets, I think would clear a lot of things up. But I think that's another task of the new evangelization is to say, hey, like, we are so much more, our attraction, that's just one small part of us. Like, we are so much more. There's so much to us. It's a mystery of being a human person created and loved by God. Like, that is so much more interesting than an attraction. So, that's that. My daughter and I work together. Sure. Yeah. Because I tell her, you know, if you want to have a good attraction, I said the church does not, not you. say yeah. you cannot belong to it Absolutely. because, quote unquote, you're homosexual. Right. I said they don't ask anything more of a homosexual person than they do of me. Right. They dig into this yourself. Three paragraphs in the catechism, but they're, there's good stuff. I'm not even doing this. I'm just trying to make the list. But paragraph 2357, 58, 2358, 2359. And, uh, it's just, and also a resource on, I got to get I'm going to go over a little bit since I started late, so shame on me, but whatever. I'm going to do it. YOLO, as they say. On, uh, yeah, not, but I created a recommendations for further reading about, it was a, it's a bonus handout, so it's not required, but um, it's a very good book called Why I Don't Call Myself Gay, How I Reclaimed My Sexual Reality and Found Peace by Daniel C. Matson. It's this man who lived an active homosexual lifestyle, and then found it unfulfilling, and then came back to the church, and <coughs> now works for the, uh, a ministry in the church called Courage. They have a website, you can go to courage.something. And um, it's all about ministering to those who have same-sex attraction. It's a beautiful thing, and, um, and I know people in my life who have same-sex attraction and are faithfully 
trying to live out their, their life in the Catholic Church, and they're happy. And yeah, they struggle, but we all struggle. And so we're all moving together and helping each other out in this fight for happiness and serving the Lord. And um, we need to teach the goodness of male and female in this union. Um, there's some quotes here. Like I love quote number nine. This is from in the in the rite of marriage um, in the church. There's this part called the nuptial blessing where the couple kneels down and the priest says this blessing over them. There's right before this part. There's a prayer for the for the bride. It says for your daughter so and so that she may be holy. Blah blah blah. And then there's a prayer for the husband and the prayer says this. May her husband entrust his heart to her, so that acknowledging her as his equal and his joint, that should be joint heir, to the life of grace, they may show her, he may show her due honor and cherish her always with the love that Christ had for his church. Wow. I love that. What if every man who got married in the church like really listened to that and um, like entrusting his heart to her? showing her honor and cherishing her. And, um, and if with women, there's a quote from, her name was Edith Stein, but she became a Carmelite and St. Teresa, Teresa Benedict of the Cross. She was a convert to Catholicism from Judaism, and she was sent to a concentration camp and killed. But quote number 10, she speaks, she praises the goodness and the dignity of, of the feminine nature by, she says, woman, naturally seeks to embrace that which is living, personal, and whole. To cherish, guard, protect, nourish, and advance growth is her maternal yearning. This maternal gift is joined to that of a companion. It is her gift and happiness to share the life of another human being, and indeed to take part in all things which come his way, the greatest and smallest things. And man is we're consumed by our enterprise. Generally, it's difficult for him to become involved in other beings and their concerns. On the contrary, it is natural for woman. The natural vocation of man is guide, her and protect, is guide and protector of his wife. Now, she doesn't say it's impossible for man to care about other people, because guys do. Um, but like, but it's just in that, has, I think, what they're getting at with the, the feminine genius, that maternal instinct of like to nurture and to care and to, to love, like your, whose body, like helps this human being grow. Like, that's what her whole spirit is ordered to. And we have a, a psychologist, uh, Dr. Susan, Suzanne Harbath, at the seminary. And she gives a lot of conferences to us. And she just talks to us, helps deal with psychological stuff. And she says a kind of a catchy thing that I think is pretty true. She says, women speak for rapport, men speak for report. And it's like, men like we got the list like doing this like I got to do this and then like women are more like the relationship and the, the emotions and like you know what's going on there and um, and that's these ah the differences aren't bad like like the fact that man has is in, driven by enterprise and like report and protecting and guarding like that's a good thing that does not in any way negate the maternal uh, nurturing aspect of the feminine of the feminine instinct you know and people and like this culture wants to make women men and men women and this is like no let men truly be men let women women truly be women like there there's a complementarity within our bodies and within our spirits and within our nature and it's so beautiful and good and we need to reclaim that as a church a priest friend of mine his mom died when he was really young he doesn't have many memories of her. And his dad remarried, and he loves his stepmom very much, and they have two other, he has two sisters through that uh, marriage. And he says, like, I love my dad. My dad did his best to raise me until he married his stepmom. But he says, as awesome as my dad was, he couldn't be a mother. As awesome as my dad was, he could not be a mom to me. And I was like, wow. Like, and that's, a, that's, and that's a beautiful thing. Like, a woman can't be a dad to a child. But that doesn't mean she's defective or not as good. And likewise, a, da a guy can't be a mom to a child. And it's like through that
complementarity, that union, is supposed to bring up this domestic church and this nourishment and these, these differences which help and make up for um, the weaknesses of the other. And I think another thing that makes marriage so difficult is that it's two weak people beginning this life together. But again, that's where the grace of God comes in and tries to make that possible. And just finally, to close out marriage, the three essential obligations is to be until death. So until death do us part. Faithfulness, fidelity, and open to having children. And so what kind of the church enumerates. And I, my point in this class is not to like go into the nitty gritty of specific marriage cases, but to sort of paint with broad strokes of the theology and foundation of marriage kind of there. And then through your own research, perhaps you can do some more digging and whatnot. But um, So that's that. Any clarifications on what I had mentioned? If not, you can stay there for afterwards. I'll, I'll be here all day. <laughs> Another shameless, I'm shameless. This is my ordination as a diaconate with my five other classmates alphabetical order, so that's me. <laughs> our pandemic, socially distant, our parents, there are some shots where it's like the photographer's back here and like it's just empty pews, but like the parents of those who were ordained. And so, so it's still really cool. It was a really special experience. So getting into to holy orders, again, directed towards the salvation of others. So in the Old Testament, we see um, the whole element of, of sacrifice and priesthood is just within human nature. It's like we are, we're hardwired for sacrifice. We, I think we're deeply moved when you, when, when you hear taps, when you see a funeral procession, like we get sacrifice, you know, and we want to sacrifice for other people. We want to live for other people. And, um, and it is, sacrifice is an essential element of priesthood. So that's why as the common priesthood, you offer sacrifices throughout your daily life, and the, the ordained priest offers the sacrifice of the Mass, and also whatever sacrifices in his own daily life. And um, so sacrifice and priesthood is just a human thing. And so throughout, oops, I don't have a slide. Just, if you look at your handout, just these different aspects. You have the Aaron, Moses' brother, who's appointed as high priest um, to assist Moses in shepherding the people and it was just the Levitical priesthood, the, the tribe of Levi. They did not get their own land, but they were ordered to care for the people, and the people in return gave them things. I should have made a slide about Melchizedek, but whatever. But Melchizedek is in bold on your handout because he's a very interesting, mysterious character. He shows up for like two verses, and then whoosh, he vanishes. But um, his name, Melchizedek, I guess would be like the Hebrew, means king of righteousness. And so he becomes a foreshadowing of, of Jesus, who is a true king of righteousness. And Genesis 14 says that he was the king of Salem. And that comes from the, um, the Hebrew word shalom, of peace. So he's the king of peace. And so that's a title of Jesus Christ, right? And Jerusalem is, Salem is in there, shalom is abode of peace. So Jerusalem is called abode of peace. So Melchizedek was the king of Jerusalem. It's really interesting stuff. And he blesses Abraham for his faithfulness to God. And he offers bread and wine. Melchizedek offers bread and wine. Eucharistic prayer one, a beautiful Eucharistic prayer, but it's the longest, so most priests don't do it. But um, we hear his name. He says, the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice is proper to the Lord. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, Psalm 110, verse 4. You are a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is an interesting character because no one knows much about him, so it's like he doesn't have a genealogy. He doesn't have, he's just a priest. That's just what he is. And so that's why the psalm prophesies, you are a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. So that's why when priests are ordained, they are still a priest after death. Whereas marriage, till death do us part, I'm hold off on that point, but um, so part, there's no marriage in heaven, and we'll come back to that. But that's not a bad thing. And Hebrews, Hebrews is, the letter to the Hebrews is very incredibly dense. 
in order to have a good working knowledge of Hebrews, you got to be aware of all the Levitical laws and Leviticus and all that. But it's very priestly. So if you want to get into priestly theology, read the book of the letter to the Hebrews. And um, Hebrews chapter 7 specifically mentions Melchizedek. Without a genealogy, he continues a priest forever. So at every priestly ordination in St. Louis, they sing an antiphon. You are a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. So if you go to my ordination next May, maybe you'll hear that. If it's open to the public, please God. But um, anyway, and Jesus Christ is the priest. So with every sacrifice, there's a priest who offers a sacrifice, and there's a victim, and there's something that's offered. But on the cross, Jesus was the priest. He was making the offering of himself, the perfect offering, the lamb without blemish, to the Father on the altar of the cross. So Jesus is high priest and victim. And Lord of the Hebrews I said that already. Are we misogynistic because of an all-male priesthood? No. I mean, just look at Mary. Like, we love Mary. Mary, queen of heaven and earth. Um, St. Therese of Lisieux, Pius X, called her the greatest saint of modern times. There's an all-male priesthood because of Christ's own masculinity. And whenever we're ordained, we, become, we are configured to Christ in a unique way by the prayer of the the prayer of ordination and the laying on of hands of the bishop. Um, our soul is ontologically changed. We receive an indelible mark, and we are conformed to Christ in a unique way. Alter Christus, I think I have that on the handout. In, oh, in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. The priest is another Christ. In spiritual fatherhood, priests are called to be a fatherly through their caring of the parish. One of my favorite, a very popular quote of about the priesthood from La Cordier, La Cordier, I don't know how to say it, but um, he was a priest, a Dominican, and he says, he's talking about priests, to live in the midst of the world without wishing its pleasures, to be a member of each family, yet belonging to none, to share all suffering, to penetrate all secrets, to heal all wounds, to go from men to God and offer him their prayers, to return from God to men and bring pardon and hope, to have a heart of fire for charity and a heart of bronze for chastity, to teach and to pardon, to console and bless always. My God, what a life, and it is yours, O priest of Jesus Christ. I intended to put that on your handout, but I was a little slack in it, so, but it's a beautiful quote. Maybe I'll have another class sometime where I do everything I wanted to say but didn't, so yeah, that would be like a 10-week course. But um, yeah, a member of every family but belonging to none. Like, like an addendum to his class. Sure, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So it's like, so a member of every family yet belonging to none. It's this intimacy without exclusivity. It's the love of man and wife is supposed to be exclusive to one another. But the priest is supposed to belong to the whole people. And so that's kind of where kind of that comes from, the spiritual fatherhood. And also, it's divinely instituted. The church does not have the power to change this. And John Paul II kind of put the nail in the coffin on this in this apostolic letter, reserving priestly ordination to men alone, ordinatio sacer vitalis, quote number 11. He says, this teaching has been preserved to men alone preserved by the constant universal tradition of the church and firmly taught by the magisterium in its most recent documents. But so, at present, in some places, it is nonetheless considered open to debate, for the church's judgment that women are not to be admitted to ordination is considered merely disciplinary force. Wherefore, in order that all doubt may be removed regarding a matter of great importance, a matter which pertains to the church's divine constitution itself, in virtue of the ministry of confirming the brethren, I declare that the church has no authority whatsoever to confer priestly ordination on women and that this judgment is to be definitively held by all the church's faithful. So his language is pretty strong and clear. And it's not because the church hates women. It's because of how Christ instituted it and how the, the church is the bride of Christ and Christ is the bridegroom. So the priest, coming to our next point, the priest is a married man. The priest's bride is the church. 
which leads to the next thing kind of flying here a little bit. So priestly celibacy, I think. Um, where was I? Yeah, so the priest is a married man. Like the, the, the church is the priest's spouse and gives himself to her. And so priestly celibacy imitates Jesus' own celibacy. And, um, and, yeah, and just like, I'll get to the practical part in a moment. And this whole attitude of spiritual fatherhood. And in scripture, Jesus praises those who, Matthew 19, 10 to 12, he says, some um, refuse marriage for the sake of the kingdom. And those who should receive it ought to receive it. So celibacy is a gift. And it's also a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice because men are denying a very good thing. They're um, refusing um, to pursue marriage and to be and to raise a family, but it's a gift because God gives the grace to faithfully live out celibacy. And like, He's not like I want Jack to be a priest because I want him to be miserable the rest of his life. And it's like no, it's like He's if He's calling me to be a priest, He knows because it'll make me happy, and He'll give me the grace in order to do it in all of our lives. Like we have a mission and a power to accomplish that mission. And of course, yes, men have failed miserably. And I'm gonna recycle my material my material from my Sunday homily of like I was in second I was in first grade first or second grade first grade when the, the Boston Globe did the whole um, breakout story of uh, the priest sex abuse scandal and so I grew up with the um, stereotype that all priests are pedophiles and I told myself as a kid I will never want that I will never want to become a priest oops <laughs> and God had other plans but, um, and it's like, sure, in going to an all-guy school, I was, I had a lot of support from my friends and family and people, but you get those people every now and then, it's like, oh, so you're a creep, huh? You're a pedophile. And it's just like, you just got to take it in stride and be like, yes, some men, um, just because these men fell doesn't mean celibacy is bad. It means that, like, they probably should not have been ordained in the first place. And it's a, and the suffering that they've inflicted on people is... It's horrible and sad, and hopefully that they can be reconciled to the church and not leave Jesus because of, how does that, they say, like, don't leave Peter because of Judas or something, or don't leave Jesus. And they're like, yeah, like, Jesus still chose Judas. He knew he would betray him, and so, like, priests are sinful people. But um, why, why it's, it's all the more important to pray for priests, to pray for holy priests, and, um, and all that good stuff. And it's it's, not, it's possible to live celibately and be happy. Um, and also practically, it's like doing all the stuff I do as a seminarian and in the future as a priest, that poor girl would be neglected if I <laughs> was dating or married. Like It would be have to be one thing or the other. Um, and sort of eschatology, which comes from the Greek word eschaton, which means that the end times. So there's no marriage in heaven. So a priest is a priest forever in heaven. And... Um, Will you see your spouse in heaven? Yes. And, like, you will love them. But, like, there's no marriage in heaven because we were finally united with God, who is our ultimate end. And there's no competition or jealousy among everyone there. Like, we will love everyone perfectly to the best of our ability, and we will be worshiping and praising God together, our ultimate end. And celibacy is a sign. So in, through my celibate life, I am pointing to the life to come of saying, I'm living for life beyond this world. I'm trying to have to strive for that union with God now on earth that I will hopefully have in heaven. And um, so it's a call to greater intimacy in prayer. And so because I'm a seminarian, I have to do this. Um, and this, I think, I think priestly formation is mysterious to most people. I think, like, where do priests come from? I think people, I didn't know we had a seminary in St. Louis until I was in high school. I didn't meet seminarian, so I think I was in like sixth grade, and even then I was like really confused. Um, but it's just, I just thought all priests were just grumpy old men, but it's like no, they start somewhere, and um, obviously, and uh, and I think people just and as I was applying to the seminary, people were like oh that's great, what are you going to do? I'm like I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> pray I guess and study, and so um, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I had no idea, and then like and so it was like a process for my parents. Um, to learn, I'm sure you get this. It's like, 
they're learning with me as I'm going through it, and it's just like, it's like, oh wow, they're like, what's a pre-theologian? And <laughs> it's just like, what's this? And we have, like the military, we have our own lingo, a lot of abbreviations and stuff, and like I'm sure you could walk through the halls and be like really confused, all this nonsense jargon going around. But John Paul II was huge in priestly formation. In 1992, he released, he released a document called I Will Give Them Shepherds, Pastores Dabo Bogis. And it about, it's all about seminary formation. And he introduces the four dimensions of priestly formation, or four pillars. This chair could not stand if I wiped out one of the legs from it, if I removed it so it would fall over. So with priestly formation, you need all of these four things. There's human formation, intellectual formation, spiritual formation, and pastoral formation. And in order to flush this out, my... First week of orientation, we're, we're sitting there, us 18, 19 year old kids not knowing what the heck we're doing. And this priest comes up to a whiteboard and he draws this. <laughs> he says, This is priestly, priestly formation is like a house. You have human formation, which is the foundation. I don't know anything about architecture or building, but I assume, I'm told, you can't build anything unless there's a firm foundation, right? You gotta have a firm foundation. Um, so, human formation is that foundation. Human formation is the raw material that the seminary has to deal with. You, you see a whole sleuth of people at the seminary, lots of different shapes and sizes and personalities, and God calls all kinds of different people. Like um, a priest, Father Dane Westoff, was here for our Steubenville retreat. He's an awesome guy. Um, he entered seminary later in life. He was a carpenter. He built his own house, dated, and had a dog, and then felt called to the priesthood, and had to sell his house, had to get rid of the dog and give up his job. I was like, what the heck am I doing? But he did it. Then you have guys like me in the Tingley who like, in that 16, 18 year old zeal, like, let's go. <laughs> this is like going right out of high school. But the church is enriched by both styles, by both people. Like Father Westhoff isn't better because he lived in the world and had experience. Like he can use that and reach people in ways perhaps I couldn't. But I can reach people perhaps in ways that he couldn't either. So the church is enriched by both. So human formation is the foundation. The emotional life of the man, his personal history, like that's all comes into play. And then intellectual formation is the walls and roof, the sturdy walls and a solid roof of the house. Learning the truths of the faith, learning virtue. Um, priests should be, I mean, you don't gotta be a valedictorian, but priests need to know a lot. They need to be smart. They need to know about the faith. And There's a lot of management stuff that I think we, uh, a lot of people say we can do better at, so like seminaries, you know, working on that. We have a lot to learn. And um, so intellectual formation is completely indispensable. It's the walls and the roof. It's the structure. It's the knowledge that we receive there. But knowledge that doesn't just serve ourselves, but it's supposed to serve other people. And um, spiritual formation is the fire within the house that gives warmth to the house. It's um, the warmth of prayer. And so you get the little smoke coming out of it. That's spiritual formation. Um, if a man doesn't pray, there's no smoke and he's cold inside. And he won't be able to spread the warmth of God's love to other people. And finally, pastoral formation, so like actual ministerial work, he said is like the door by which you open up and welcome people into your experience of prayer, your experience of God, what you know, and the foundation of who you are. John Paul II says the priest's personality and his humanity is supposed to serve as a bridge and not an obstacle to people encountering the Lord. And so I could be the smartest guy ever. I could be the holiest and the holiest guy ever. I could pray all the time, be super holy. And maybe I have a zeal to do stuff. But if I don't shower, or if I'm like painfully socially awkward, like none of this will, will work. If I'm very charismatic and fun and whatever, and smart, and have initiative, I guess, but I don't pray, then like I'm not, people aren't going to be inspired by what I do. They're not going to see Christ if I don't pray. Um, I could be charismatic and gifted and humanly. I could be smart. I could be holy. 
but I don't want to put myself out there and do and meet with people like I am I'm contracepting my vocation like people we talk about you know contraception and, and marriage but like priests we can contracept our vocation it's like I could not pray and or not prepare for my homilies and just mumble garbage and then no one would be satisfied or I could refuse to go hear confessions and give absolution or I wake up in the morning no I'm not going to celebrate mass today like priests we can cut ourselves off from our vocations of giving life. And um, so all these go together to, to build this. And it's a, talk about marriage is messy. Seminary formation is messy. And it's a lifelong thing. I'll constantly be learning after the seminary. Like, I still need to read and do stuff. I still need to shower after seminary. <laughs> um, I still need to pray after I leave the seminary. It's easy to pray in the seminary. We have Four chapels. It's a beautiful, beautiful chapel. It's it's very conducive to prayer, you know. And um, and I constantly need to be learning how I can better reach people and all that stuff. So this is what, in a nutshell, this is what happens at 5200 Glennon Drive, St. Louis, Missouri. It's all of this stuff. And like Dr. Harvath, whom I mentioned before, is huge in just this, like dealing with both like the psychological and this emotional health. Can't. Uh, it's a shame. Like it wasn't until like 1992 that this document came out, and like now only recently we're starting to see the fruits of this. And so I don't want to. And so like all these older priests say like, man, we didn't have this stuff when we were in seminary. Like maybe it was overly intellectual or not enough human. And so, um, but they're still good men and still good priests. But like praise God that seminary formation is what it is today. And. Um, and I'm not saying that seminarians are God's gift to the world, but it's a good thing. It's a special thing for this parish, I think, that you get to be a part of seminary formation. You are a part of this process. Last year, you had two of my classmates, um, Kevin and Chris, and, and I'm here this year. And so, like, hopefully you can come to my ordination or watch it live streamed, and you can be proud. And you can say, hey, I had something to do with that. Because, like, you have a part. The lay faithful have an active role to play in the formation of their priest. We are priests for you. So you need to ask yourselves, what type of priest do I want ministering to me? What type of priest do I want ministering to my children, to my grandchildren? And hopefully you want happy, holy, and healthy priests. And so you're not just supposed to sit, sit back and be like, I hope the seminary cranks out good priests. It's like you got to pray and donate financially. <laughs> but um, no, you have an actor, and like, and so I think it's a unique thing for a parish to get a seminarian to be to be a part of that man's formation. And I've already been blessed by the couple months I've been here, and um, it's it all goes to form men to be other Christs. And so I'll close with this awesome John Vianney says it all right here that the priesthood is the love of the heart of Jesus, and he says if we understood the priesthood we would die. Not of fright, but of love. And so the fact that God loved the world, that he sent his only son, that he doesn't want subsequent generations to be devoid of the love of Christ. So he instituted the priesthood to reveal the love of his sacred heart, which is our parish. And um, so that's sort of my tour de force on the priesthood. And just to close, I'm, I'm very grateful that you guys came to this at all. Um, I don't know if you, I had fun doing this. It was fun doing it. was a lot of work, but I enjoyed doing it, and I was happy that anyone even came to it. And um, hopefully, uh, I, I'll be part-time from here on out, but like hopefully something can work out where I can do something else. But um, I know Father Mike's going to continue Lexio Divina, which is awesome, but um, I'm just grateful to be a part of this parish and to be kind of with all of you. So let's close with the glory be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. John Vianney, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Twelve minutes overtime.